Lord, we thank you for the lamb, so soft, so gentle, so kind, so loving, so peaceful, and yet so powerful that the lamb can erase all of our sins, all of our griefs, and all of our sorrows. And it is in the name of that lamb, even Jesus the Christ, that we do pray and give thanks and ask for the power to preach the word that came from the lamb to feed the people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're able, will you please rise to your feet at this time that we may view the scriptural text for this morning. And it is found in the, the gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And it reads this way. It's Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Ituria, and Traconictus and Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene, uh, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. And you may be seated in the presence of the Lord as we preach this morning with an Advent-focused message entitled, A New World Order. A New World Order. You will hear in the background uh, a song by the musical artist Curtis Mayfield. Uh, Curtis Mayfield in 1997... Uh, lifted up this message about a new world order. Uh, it, it's a message to awaken our sense and our senses to the preeminence of God's salvation over the reign of sin in the worldly realm. Uh, it's a time when we call uh, upon our consciousness to see the brightness of hope and the newness of change. No matter what gloom and doom that hovers over us like a dark cloud in the sky, Luke challenges us to get excited that God is shifting the order of power in the world and he tells us to stay encouraged. Political leaders have attempted to create a new world order, uh, going back to President Woodrow Wilson and even more recently, uh, George Herbert Walker uh, Bush, who was uh, funeralized and uh, buried uh, this week. And it was in the late 1980s when he and Mikhail uh, Gorbachev from Russia were having this dialogue about creating a new world order where there would be less use of force and more peace through partnerships, where forces of government would, would find ways to come together and not rely on nuclear power and other means of military ways to 
create divisions and unite them in ways that the world would be at peace. But those efforts and the rhetoric did not reach a way of consensus. In fact, here in our own country, uh, those who heard the words of a new world order by then President George Herbert Walker uh, Bush about a new world order thought that he may have been suggesting a way of weakening our power in the world by not emphasizing how great a nation we were and that we did not have to partner with other superpowers in order to maintain the peace. The bigger our weapons, the greater our power, the more able we were able in his mind to create order or those who opposed him. Mikhail Gorbachev was trying to create this sense of pluralism and tolerance and social justice in the world received the same opposition in his own country. And what, made, what that made clear to me as I began to look and search and research uh, the history of those conversations and, and those statements and speeches about a new world order, it, it took me right back to this text in this Advent season when I realized that Luke, who was not only a medical doctor, but he was recognized as the historian among the, uh, the apostles, and he lifted up these names of leaders of the world at that time, and he lifts them up not so much to praise them or honor them, but to contrast them with what was about to occur. Uh, if you look at how he lifts up in the very first uh, verse, Tiberius uh, Caesar, who was the emperor of Rome, Rome trying to create this dynamic relationship in the world where people feared them, but their military might was not that great, but the way they were able to rule in the world at that time was to use their small army to crush and destroy those who opposed them, but to generally create an atmosphere of compliance and obedience from nations that did not have military might of their own. So even in Israel, you had leaders who, rather than fighting and resisting, were willing to just comply and, and obey and even imitate the ways of the Roman government. And so that was what was happening at the time. They put in place people like Pontius Pilate, who you remember in his role as governor of Judea, washed his hands when he had the, the opportunity to free uh, Jesus from crucifixion. Uh, you had Herod, who attempted uh, to kill all of the male children, causing Jesus and his family to become refugees and immigrants leaving their own homeland to find safety in another nation, in another continent, even Africa. And so we have these leaders who are attempting to show their might and their power, but not finding a way to create lasting peace and enduring a peace in their world. So Luke lifts them up, and he doesn't limit it to just the political leaders of the time, but he also shoves in these religious leaders, Annas and Caiaphas, who were the, 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 the supreme leader of the Sadducees, who would get together with the Pharisees and create elements of oppression among the people. The people were overtaxed. The people were not able to thrive and survive in their society because between these religious leaders and the political leaders, they were constantly under threat of the use of force or excessive uh, taxes, and, and they were unable to use the resources they had to take care of their families, to receive an education, to share in the benefits and the fruit of the land because they had to give so much of what they had back to the Roman Empire, uh, to the governor of Judea, to Herod the Tetrarch, and to the church itself. And so Luke lifts up these folks to say that at the time there was a sense of domination. People were under the control of the leaders, the political and the religious leaders of the, the time. People were stressed out. Uh, people were depressed. People felt 
felt handcuffed and didn't have opportunities to explore all of the gifts that had been given to them because they were under the domination of these political forces. Domination has a way of causing people uh, either to resist or either obey or sometimes even begin to imitate the culture as a way of a safety device or a way of being defensive. They turn into the very enemy that they oppose, but they want to find ways to look like the enemy and act like the enemy. And soon before they know it, they turn into the very culture that the enemy has been trying to impose from the very beginning. So there's this period of domination. And then I thought about the domination for this Advent season because I recognize that there are those among us who want to feel a sense of joy and excitement in this, in this season of giving, in the season of receiving, the, the season of Advent upcoming Christmas, people really want to have a sense of joy, and yet they understand there are forces in the world that are stealing their joy and, and robbing their dreams, and they're trying to understand, and that's why people come to church to feel a sense of fellowship, some encouragement, something to uplift their spirit, because when they think about it, they are actually going through some sorrows and some difficulties and going through illnesses and some situations in their life that are making it hard to experience and feel the joys that people are telling them that they want to feel. Just yesterday, I was uh, talking to, to, to Minister Brown, and she walked into the church, and I asked her how she was doing, and, and she was truthful enough to say that there was a, a strain in her leg because in her job, she has to stand up all the time. And I was thinking about the strain in my own leg because I have to sit down at a desk every day. And then I hear a young girl this morning saying, well, my mother just wants a job. You all may be experiencing all of these difficulties. There are people who are upset about being overworked. There are people who are feeling that even in the church, there are tasks that they are asked to perform, and there's no gratification from those, those tasks and those, those jobs because there's no recognition of the sacrifice it takes for people to, to do the work that they've been called on to do to serve the Lord, and yet there are some other people who are looking for opportunities and wonder why they keep getting passed over and why they have not had an opportunity to demonstrate leadership. There are people who feel stressed out and stretched out because they, 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 there's just too much to do in this season. I have birthday parties to go to and Christmas parties to go to, and I have to go shopping. And I thought about it myself with the people who are so stressed out about planning and participating in all of their parties. Just this week, it came to me that this very day, I would love to be celebrating the birthday of someone very special to me, but there will be no cake, there will be no candle, and yet I have to continue to look for the joy that God has given to us, who has promised to us, and continue to look at his word, which tells us even though we live in a world of political leadership that doesn't look at our, our best interests all the time, political leadership and even religious leadership that takes away the, 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 the joy of children coming to church for fear of sexual predators, even in the church today, people feeling taken advantage of, even by religious leaders and political leaders, and feeling dominated that somehow there has to be a word, there has to be a way of coming from under this domination and finding some peace. And so I'm so happy that Luke said, you don't have to feel so dominated. I, I, I purposely, this is Luke's way of looking at it, I purposely set out in the very first few verses of this chapter the seven leaders of the nation. And seven in spiritual language generally refers to a sense of completion. When you get to the number seven, 
there is a divine recognition that an era is ended and another one is about to begin. And Luke is lifting up for us in this very same passage that these leaders are going to be passed. The domination, which is also symbolized by sin, it's not just the political leaders that are dominating the experiences of the people, but sin itself has a grip hold on the people and is taking their happiness away, taking their joy away. And Luke is saying in this passage that that is about to end. Domination is about to end because the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness, not in the temple, not in the castle, not in places where you would expect for high-minded people to get a special world, but word. But in the wilderness, the word came to John. And when John heard the word, he recognized there were certain things that he had to do. And so just for a moment, after talking about domination, I want to talk about preparation. Because we have to prepare ourselves in this season of Advent for the preparation of Jesus the Christ coming in uh, to the world. And there was something that had to be done by John who lived out in the wilderness and called upon people who were down and out, people who were poor, people who were jobless, people who were homeless, people who were full of grief and guilt and trying to figure out how they could make it in life. And John began to preach in the wilderness about forgiveness and repentance and he started talking about salvation. He came, when the word came to John, he went out in the wilderness and began to preach to prepare. And what did he, what did he come to prepare? He came to prepare a clean, clear road to prepare the people for the coming of Jesus the Christ. Luke refers back to Isaiah in, in, in the Old Testament, who prophesied that there would come a time that this word would come and, and, and every mountain and every hill uh, would be made low. The valleys would uh, be exalted. The, the crooked places would be made straight. The rough places would be made plain. So the word of God coming to John, inspiring him to move into the realm of the people who did not have the joy they thought they should have at that time of year, that the word came and the word had so much power that if there were gaps in their lives, if there were valleys in their lives, the word could fill those gaps. If there were mountains and hills in the way of, of the coming of the Lord, then the word was powerful enough to knock down those barriers, those hills, those mountains, so people could see on the other side of the mountain and see their blessing and see their future and be encouraged to just stand up a little bit longer. But not only that, Luke tells us through the words of Isaiah, referring back to Isaiah, that there were a lot of distractions that kept people from experiencing the joy of the Lord. And that was that there were zigzag roads. There were crooked paths. And people would know, well, I can't see the end because the path seems to go in different directions. And so the word came to John so that he could straighten out those paths. And not only that, but there were some rough places, the kind of places that would cause you to stumble and fall. And, but the word came to John that he could smooth out those words, those, those paths and those roads so people would have an easy, smooth, clear path in preparation for the coming of the Lord. And the way I started thinking about it, Deacon Frazier, is that there is a, a segment of the government it's called the Army Corps of, of Engineers. Some of you who know what they do know that they are specialized 
specialized trained forces that go into places and they begin to build the infrastructure and clear out paths so other units of the military can get to where they need to be for strategic advantages. So the Army Corps of Engineers will go to a beachhead and begin to build a path so the heavy equipment and artillery could come in through the Marines so that they could get a place that would give them an advantage over the enemy. And so what Luke is lifting up, that John, when he heard the word and went out preaching, decided to do what the Army Corps of Engineers does for other military units, and he was doing this for the coming of the Lord. And I am so glad that he lifts this, this, this up as something that happens in this season of Advent, even before Jesus to Christ arrives. There was a sense of preparation. There were strategic ways that caused the people to be ready to receive uh, the word of God. And the purpose of the preparation was to build within the people the joy of upcoming liberation. Liberation from the domination of the, the fears and of the threats of fear and the, the threats of the use of force by the rulers of the world at that time. A, 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 a sense of we're being prepared to be liberated because into our midst soon will come the one who came to set the captives free. And right now we are feeling that we are captives. We are feeling captives of our depression and our disappointments. And somehow we are looking for a way to leave this church even today with a sense of joy, knowing that God is coming and the steps that we see is that the word is going out and being preached to prepare the way for Jesus to Christ to come again. And that's what we should come to church every day. I, 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 I struggled with this, Reverend Lisa, for a little while when I, when I looked at the, uh, the scripture and it said the, 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 the word came to John and the, and the word had power and, and the word was inspiring to, uh, John to go into the wilderness and to prepare a way and to, to, to exalt the valleys and to tear down the mountains and to straighten the crooked roads and, and, and smooth out the, the rough roads. The word was doing this and I always thought the, the word was Jesus the Christ, but John was actually preparing the way for Jesus to come. And so this word was something I'm like, well, why, why? Because Jesus could do this all by himself. Jesus could tear down mountains. Uh, Jesus could exalt the valleys. But why is it that in this scripture that we have today, there was preparation before liberation? And it wasn't, uh, Sister Tomlin, until last night when I started listening to the children's choir of Watoto from Uganda who began singing their songs and having this concise message that said, we will go, we will go. Edwin and Elizabeth talking about, we will go. The word hit John, passed his ear into his heart, and the Bible says that he went. He went when he heard the word, and that's what God is putting us in a position today, that we have a responsibility, we have a partnership to hear the word and to go. If the Uganda children who come out of homes of great poverty, orphans and people who have not had the good things in life that we have can travel halfway around the world to talk about the love of Jesus, to talk about his goodness and his grace and his mercy. If they can come out and say, we will go, then we ought to say the same thing. It's what John did. He went. And he went not in the nice places. He went into the wilderness. And he went where those roads were crooked and where the roads were rough and where the mountains were tall and where the valleys were low. And he did, through the presence of the word, begin to fill in those gaps and tear down those barriers and straighten out crooked things and to smooth out those things that were rough. And because of that, we can have a liberation. Liberation that gives in us the joy of knowing that Jesus Christ is on his way back. Well, I said that I 
was pondering the number of people who are going through situations. And even though we sing songs of joy and we fellowship with one another, I know there are things that we are going through. And I am not um, unmindful that there are people who are just trying to find a way to give me some hope. There are people who have lost loved ones recently. There are people who are looking for jobs right now. There are people who are ill or they're close to somebody who is ill. There are people with real needs looking for some hope, anticipating hope. And the one thing that will give you joy is if you join in the partnership with the Watoto children, with John, in spreading the word. Because the word will give you joy. The word will give you power. The word will give you deliverance. The word will give you hope. The word will give you help. The the word will give you what you need in your time of need. And I definitely needed it. This week I was at a conference. And it was a a conference where civil rights leaders from across the country uh, came to deliberate about the political leadership and the things that we are facing with this current administration and this Congress. And they began to talk, and one of the signs of hope uh, came out of Florida. One of my uh, dear friends, Desmond Mead, uh, was, was there to talk about his great victory on November 6th in Florida where the state overwhelmingly passed, and by that I mean over 64% of the people in Florida who had historically kept people with past felony convictions from participating in our democracy. Uh, Florida where over two million people can't vote because sometime in their past they made a mistake, they got caught, they got sentenced, some of them didn't even go to jail. But because they have a mark on their record, uh, they cannot vote. 2.5 million. And you may remember in 2000, the presidential election was decided because out of Florida, there was a difference of 537 votes. And 2.5 million people in Florida cannot participate because of a past felony conviction. They have paid their debt. They are in churches, they are in businesses, they're doing great things, but because of this mark, they have been unable to, to, to participate. But in November, Desmond Mead, leading a coalition of impacted people, pushed a ballot through that will create an, a, a, a way for people with past felony convictions. Over 1.4 million new voters in Florida, and it was a great victory, and I was happy for him because I have seen his struggles in life and how those struggles have not kept him down. Uh, Desmond, you see, will tell you face to face that I've made mistakes in my past. I have a felony conviction in my past. I had a drug addiction that kept me going in and out of prison, and in fact, the last time I came out of prison, I faced a railroad track And I was prepared to put my body on that railroad track because I knew I had disappointed the people who had raised me right. And But I I decided that I'm going to just end my life and I won't have to go to jail anymore. I won't have to deal with this hard addiction. And so he was headed to the railroad track and a noise distracted him. And as he looked in the direction of the distraction, he he saw a rehab center. and, And he checked himself into that rehab center. And he performed everything he was supposed to do. And he got out and decided to get his GED degree. And he decided to go to college. And he graduated from college and he decided to go to law school. And he graduated with high honors in law school. And he got out and began to lead other people like him. And so I'm sitting at the table. And I've heard Desmond's story time and time again. But there was something about this day that caused me just to listen, and before I knew it, uh, my face on the right side was wet, and my face on the left side was wet, and I was trying to figure out where all this moisture is coming from, and then I realized that my, 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 my eyes were, were leaking, and, and, and my eyes were leaking because out of the thousand people that were there with ten people to each table, somehow I was led to the table with the number 33, 
And 33 was the number of years uh, that my brother Gregory uh, lived on this earth. And that was almost 30 years ago. Because today would be Gregory's birthday. And that's the cake I can't cut. That's the candle I'm not lighting. And in my heart there is, is, is sorrow, but there is hope because I knew that he knew Jesus uh, the Christ. And I know that Jesus has found a way to help us put more emphasis on people that get caught up and chewed up by a system of mass incarceration when they have huge burdens and, and on their chest that they can't express and they have a sickness of addiction and they don't know how to, to get out of it. And I could tell you many, many stories about him and he knows and my family knows and some of you know that we do hold our people accountable and we want them to show uh, self-responsibility but every once in a while there's a mass incarceration a system that decides to drag them away from their families drag them away from the help they need, and puts them in a position. So my brother died only a few thousand feet from where we are right now in, the D in a D.C. jail cell. And that's the mass incarceration system that I know took my brother away from us, despite everything that he did. And let's be honest about it, there are a lot of things he could have done and should have done. But he didn't do because we have this system of oppression that is set up by political leaders and not enough churches doing enough to counter uh, those systems of oppression. So people get caught up and chewed up and they are no longer with us. But I am uh, so happy about the irony that I also saw because Gregory was the only one in my family of the, our three siblings that was going to follow in my father's footsteps uh, as a minister. Uh, Gregory, the taller, leaner, more hair than me, a version of me who was smarter than me, who had a lot of uh, personality, a lot of uh, charm, who had leadership qualities, he went down to Virginia Union, as my father did, and is in his very first year of college, he was elected president of his class. And in his sophomore year, he was elected president of his class. And he was to continue in that, but because, again, of structures uh, that exist, that did not happen for him. So he did not follow in the footsteps uh, of my father, even though he was the only one of the Hales children that was going to follow in my father's footstep. And the fact that I am standing uh, in this pulpit and my sister, uh, Pastor Patricia Hales Fears, is celebrating her second anniversary at Fellowship Baptist Church just shows you that God has a divine plan. He can overcome the most difficult moments of our life. He can give us victory. He can give us joy. And so we find through him the liberation that takes us from domination, through preparation, and through uh, salvation. So that's all I really wanted to share with you today, that God came to shift from the political structure to the divine structure that puts Jesus on top, that puts God on top, that puts the, the leaders on his shoulders so that we can get from under domination and find the liberation uh, through preparation. So this is the season when the word of God should hit your ears and hit your heart and you go out wherever you can go and start preaching to other people about forgiveness because people are hurting and they can't forgive themselves. And when we get people to forgive themselves, they can turn around and do the things that the Lord wants them to do. And go out and preach about repentance. And go and baptize people. That's what we are called upon to do in this season of preparation so our people can have salvation and have a liberation. So I end with this, a song that came to my heart and my spirit, and you know it well, and that is that, Lord, you made a way. 
And we're standing here only because uh, you made a way. When our backs were against the wall and it looked like it was over, Lord, you made a way. And we're standing here only because you made a way. I'm standing here because you made a way. And you're standing there because God made a way. And we're all standing because God made a way. Prepare your way, prepare the way for the blessings and the coming of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, God, for your holy word. Uh, thank you for your prophets and priests and preachers spreading the word that will prepare the way for the Lord. And thank you for the Lord himself who came as a small child, a gentle lamb to sacrifice himself that we may find wholeness and forgiveness and have a eternal relationship with you. Uh, Lord, we, we thank you for your goodness and your eternal mercy. And now we open the doors of this church to anyone who is looking for a connection in this time where you know what you're going through. You know what you, you, you can't hide it with expensive clothes and beautiful smiles and makeup. Some of us are hurting. And we need a touch, we need a word, and I'm so thankful we can come to this place and hear it. But we also have to share it. It's something about the connection of the ear and the mouth. When it goes out and it, and it goes into the ear and it goes out of the mouth, it doubles the power of the word. So spread the word, help other people to see that we love and we praise and we honor an all true everlasting God of love and power. And so the doors of the church are open. If you have not yet given your life to Christ, we encourage you to do it in this season of Advent as we prepare for the coming of the Lord. The doors of the church are open for those seeking baptism. And you can come for baptism by Christian experience. You can come by letter, but we want you to come, for the Lord is coming, and we want you to know that he is continuing to help us to stand up. We don't know how he did it, but we trust in his word and his commitments to us, and so the doors of the church are open. The doors of the church are open now. Let us sing with Zamar this song of encouragement this song of reminder, this song of power that commits us to this path of standing. The fact that we are standing right now is only because of God's grace and his mercy. Thank you, Lord, for being such a loving and gracious God. already within the ark of safety, that Jesus has a hedge, a fence around you, then you may take a seat at this time. If you are unsure that you have a dynamic relationship with the church that can give you opportunities to share the word, please come forward. We pray for you, and we thank you for attending. But we want you to leave here empowered and encouraged. We want you to participate in the preparation of, of the coming of Jesus to Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, that can take us from being down and under to up and above. The same God who gives us hope when we felt hopeless.
thank you and we praise God. Amen.